Hello everyone, in this video, we are going to review the subtopic 2.2 separating and purifying substances. In this subtopic, we are going to learn how to determine the purity of a substance and discuss different methods of separations. Before we go any further, let us discuss the difference between pure and impure substances. Now, what is meant by pure substances? Pure substance, it has no particles of any substances mixed with it. And the most important thing that you need to note is that it has definite or fixed melting and boiling points. Now, what does it mean by impure substance? Impure substance has particles of other substances mixed with it. And in contrary to pure substances, it melts at a lower temperature and boils at a higher temperature. For instance, in this example, we have the heating curve of naphthalene and wax. Which of these substances is pure? The answer is naphthalene because it has definite or fixed melting point. We have learned how to differentiate pure and impure substances. Now the question is, why is it important to have pure substances? The answer is simple. We need the unique chemical properties of the pure substances for many important uses. For instance, medicine, vaccines, medical drugs, etc. Now that we have seen the importance of having pure substances, let us see a few separation techniques to separate a mixture of pure and impure substances in order for us to get the precious pure substance. The techniques are filtration, chromatography, crystallization, and in distillation, we're going to see two types of distillation, which are simple distillation, and also fractional distillation. I would recommend you to draw a mind map to differentiate these different techniques easily. Important terms that you need to know before we proceed with the techniques. First, we have solute, which is a substance in which that we can dissolve in a solvent. For instance, in this case, water to produce a solution. Thus, a solution is a mixture you make when dissolving a substance in a solvent. Bear in mind that a mixture is a combination of two and more substances that are not chemically combined. We shall start with the first technique, filtration. Filtration is used to separate insoluble solids from liquids. For example, we can use filtration to separate a mixture of sand and water. By the end of this process, we shall have the solid as residue remaining in the glass funnel and water as filtrate. The second technique is called as chromatography. Paper chromatography is used to separate two or more dissolved solids in solution for colored substances. For instance, we can use paper chromatography to separate the different substances in ink pen or in the cordial drink. How does chromatography work? In summary, the mixture is dissolved in a suitable solvent, for instance water and alcohol. Then, the solution is allowed to travel across paper. Bear in mind that the substances in the solution travel at different speeds and separate. It depends on the different solubility in the solvent and the attraction to the paper they travel over. For example, in this picture, we have the sample A, B, and C. Judging by the distance traveled by B, B is the most soluble in the solvent and the attraction onto the paper is weak, enabling B to travel further than sample A and C. When can we use paper chromatography? Paper chromatography can be used to find out how many substances are present in the mixture. For example, in this picture, we have the separation of the ink spot and by the end of the process, we can see that the ink spot has been separated into different types of substances. 
We can also use paper chromatography to check the purity of the substance. So if impurities are present, they will separate out. For instance, in this picture, we can see that the sample A and D are pure because they only have one spot. But for sample B and C, they are impure because when they are separated, we can see that there are two different spots being separated. How do you set up the paper chromatography? First thing first is that you need to draw the baseline and also the solvent front using a pencil. What you can do is that you can draw the baseline 0.5 cm from the bottom of the paper and also the solvent front 0.5 cm from the top of the paper. And then you can place a spot of the ink on the baseline. The second step is that you need to make the paper stand upright in a beaker containing a little water, which is the solvent, and then you put a lid on the beaker. Bear in mind that the level of the solvent must be lower than the level of the baseline. The third step is that you need to allow the water to rise up the paper. When it is near to the solvent top, you remove the paper and dry it in an oven. The last step is that you're going to analyze the spots. So what you can do here, for example, is that you can calculate the RF. For instance, in this case, you can see that here you have the three dyes, red, yellow, and blue. So you can try to calculate the RF for these three spots. Paper chromatography can also be used to separate and identify amino acids in a mixture. As amino acids are invisible to our naked eyes, locating agents such as ninidrine can be used to make the spots visible. Besides using the locating agents, we can also use UV lights to identify the invisible spots. In order to be more precise, we can use measurements on the paper to compare the distance traveled by our substance with the distance traveled by the solvent. This is known as an RF value or the retention factor. The RF value can be calculated by the distance traveled by the spot divided by the distance traveled by the solvent. For instance, in this example, we have two spots, blue and yellow. Before calculating the RF for both of these spots, it is imperative for us to know what is the distance traveled by the solvent. In this case, 8.5, which is the length in between the baseline and also the solvent front. Then we can measure the distance traveled by each spot. By calculating the RF, we can see that the yellow spot is more soluble in the solvent chosen as the, its RF is higher than the blue spot. The third separation technique is crystallization. It is used to separate solute from a solution by evaporation. Imagine that we have an impure solid in which we have a mixture of A and B. These two substances are dissolved in a chosen solvent. After heating up the solution until saturated, the solution is left to cool. During this period, we shall see that the pure substances will emerge as crystals while the impurities shall stay in the solution. The crystals may then be filtered off, washed with a bit of cold water, and then dried in air or in the oven. The fourth technique is simple distillation. It is used to separate a liquid from a solute if we want to keep the liquid. For instance, we want to separate the water in the seawater, which contains water and dissolved salt. How does simple distillation work? First, we evaporate the liquid by heating, and then we're going to condense the vapor into liquid by cooling. We will see an example where we want to separate the water from the seawater. So first thing first that we're going to do is that we're going to heat the mixture. As we heat the liquid, the liquid will evaporate into vapor at its boiling point and then the vapor will be condensed back to liquid in the cool condenser. 
the salt will remain in the flask while pure water is collected in the conical flask. The last technique is called fractional distillation, which is used to separate two different liquids that mix completely at two different boiling points. For example, here we have water with its boiling point at 100 Celsius and ethanol with its boiling point 79 Celsius. For instance, we want to separate the mixture of ethanol and water. What we're going to do is that we're going to heat the solution first and because ethanol has lower boiling point, we're going to see that the ethanol vapor will pass into the condenser first at ethanol's boiling point and the pure ethanol will be collected. Stop collecting when the temperature rises. Water has higher boiling point. Water vapor will pass into the condenser at water's boiling point. And then we're going to collect the water in a separate beaker. That's the end of the subtopic 2.2. Should you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask. See you in the next video where we will be discussing the subtopic 2.3 atoms and molecules and 2.4 the structure of the atom.